Thank you so much for introduction and for inviting me to uh, be here with you all to uh, on, on this very exciting uh, lecture series on uh, sites of worship in pre-monarchic Israel. What an exciting topic. Um, pre-monarchic Israel has been really an obsession of mine since uh, since I uh, first was in graduate school <clears throat> back in the in 1991 and two, my first uh, master's class was a seminar in the book of Joshua. <laughs> and I've been obsessed with uh, early Israelite origins uh, since that time. And uh, most of what I've done um, throughout my career has focused on uh, on these topics of early Israelite origins. <clears throat> but um, I'm not going to be, uh, if you were at my previous lecture uh, that Aaron put together uh, during that talk, <clears throat> I focused on the archaeology of Mount Ebal and uh, <clears throat> just talked about all the uh, physical details of the site. <clears throat> but um, uh, Aaron said that during this series, we, he wanted to focus on um, worship in pre-monarchic Israel. And uh, so I, I am going to talk about Mount Ebal, but I thought uh, the best way to do that <clears throat> is to uh, look at the biblical text. And uh, so we're going to work our way through some of the details in Joshua 8, 30 through 35. And I'll, I will highlight some of the physical details about the structure, uh, but I'll also be um, uh, looking at some details in the text with you as well. Um, so let's jump right in. And um, uh, and I should also say thank you to all of you in attendance. I'm, um, it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with uh, people who are interested in the Bible and interested in archaeology. And uh, I'm sure you come from all different denominational backgrounds and um, uh, faith perspective. So um, uh, it's just an honor to uh, be able to share with you today. And uh, I, you see I'm wearing a collar. So <laughs> right off the bat, you, you know that I have some faith commitments as well. I'm also a parish priest. <laughs> so I'm coming right from uh, services. So, uh, but in any case, great to be with you. And I, I won't waste time. We'll jump right in and have time for questions at the end. Um, we're going to be discussing the altar on Mount Ebal, <clears throat> which, of course, is featured in Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 through 35. And the altar is introduced in uh, Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 through 32. <clears throat> and if you have your Bible, uh, you're welcome to open it up to these to this passage, we'll we'll come back uh, periodically, and we'll be looking at, at details in this passage. But uh, verse thirty says, "Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, <clears throat> the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal." And, and this uh, is, of course, in fulfillment of the instructions given by Moses. <clears throat> and if you go back to the Book of Deuteronomy. Moses, uh, the Lord had said through Moses back in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 29 through 30, uh, he had given the instruction saying, uh, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land that you're about to occupy, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. As you know, they are beyond the Jordan, uh, some distance to the west in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah opposite Gilgal beside the Oak of Moray. That's uh, Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine, And then so here when we turn uh, to the very next book after Deuteronomy, the book of Joshua, Joshua tells us uh, that that's exactly what he did. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel on Mount Ebal. So uh, the book of Deuteronomy purports to give us the fulfillment of those instructions that had originally been um, given by Moses. Uh, so that's the biblical account. Uh, I want to very briefly, just in case there were some of you who were not here for my 
previous talk about the archaeology of Mount Ebal, I just want to uh, give you a quick snapshot of uh, the discovery and excavation of that site. But our primary focus here today is going to be in the text. Um, but back in uh, 1980, let's say I'm going to stick with this slide for a minute. Back in 1980, um, during the early days of an archaeological survey conducted by an Israeli archaeologist named Adam Zertal, um, he was going to survey the entire uh, region of Manasseh, and you can see in this map here, um, uh, there's the Dead Sea down there, the Jordan River going up here, and this whole area that is uh, enclosed in the lines here is the region of Manasseh. That was the largest of the tribal allotments uh, allocated to the early Israelites um, during the settlement period. Uh, the book of Joshua says in uh, Joshua chapters uh, 13 through 21 that Joshua sat down, you can imagine him sitting down at a big table and spreading out a big piece of butcher paper and drawing out a map of Israel and uh, saying, okay, you, uh, you from the tribe of Issachar, you're going to settle here. You from the tribe of Asher, you're going to settle here. You from the tribe of Judah, you're going to settle here. And then he drew this very large area in the heartland of Israel and said, you Manassites are going to settle here. And uh, that region goes all the way, picks up just north of the Dead Sea, and it goes about halfway up toward the Sea of Galilee and then spreads out into the highlands. And it also encompasses part of the area east of the Jordan River. So it's the largest of the 12 tribal allotments because it encompasses both the heartland west of the Jordan River and it encompasses some of the highlands uh, east of the Jordan River as well. So quite an expansive area. And uh, in the late 1970s, Adam Zertal um, launched a survey of that region as his uh, PhD dissertation. And um, I don't know if he realized it at the time, but that survey would take the rest of his life and longer. <laughs> he launched the survey in 1978. Uh, he died in 2015 and his uh, protege, uh, Shai Bar, whom you heard from last week, uh, Shai Bar continues that survey even today. And it's been published in, you can see over here on the map, uh, each of these, it's been subdivided into smaller areas, volume one, volume two. You can see all the way through volume nine. Uh, and this is not totally accurate uh, because they keep extending it. <laughs> now they're projecting 10 or 11 volumes. So uh, it's quite expansive. Um, but I just got in the mail the latest volume the other day, and I don't even remember which that is. I think it's volume eight. But in any case, uh, these are being published in English, and you can get those. They're quite expensive, though. Uh, but in any case, so in 1980, <clears throat> during the early days of the survey of Manasseh, um, <clears throat> a massive cairn was discovered on Mount Ebal. So this is a picture here of the cairn and uh, a cairn is just a big pile of stones. <laughs> so you can see uh, here's a guy standing on the cairn. Uh, the, the word cairn is used for a big pile of stones. The, the key to understand what a cairn is, uh, uh, it's a man-made pile of stones. So it's, it's different from like uh, water runoff might wash stones down a hill and they might accumulate in the ditch. That's not a cairn. A cairn is when a person or people pile up stones, right? So that's a, a, a cairn, uh, stones covering something up. And in the cairn, Adam found uh, a whole bunch of pottery dating to the early Iron Age. So he knew that this cairn covered an early Iron Age structure. Early Iron Age uh, from Adam's dating would be 1250 BC to about 1000 BC. Um, the site is known in Arabic as El Bernat, <clears throat> and it lies on a mountain ridge high above sea level and far from any roads. Um, he knew there was an early Iron Age structure there, and he wanted to excavate an early Iron Age structure to provide a control for the survey. When you do a broad survey 
you're only studying what you find on the surface of the ground and you have to excavate an actual site in order to test your survey findings. So you, you draw hypothetical conclusions from a survey and you test them by excavation. So he chose this as a site for excavation and he excavated it over a series of eight seasons from 1982 to 1989. Now the site yielded two levels that uh, uh, levels in archeology span are called stratum. Okay, or they call it plural is strata. I'm sorry, my clicker is not working. So I'm gonna reach up and do this by hand. Uh, so the first stratum <coughs> was stratum two. And uh, this dated from roughly uh, 1250 BC to the mid to the late 13th century. So, uh, you know, uh, 1200 um, or 1199. So about, about 1250 to 1200. That was when the site was founded. And you can see this stratum consisted of a uh, structure. Now it's a little bit tricky here because um, this drawing represents here the later structure. Uh, stratum two consisted of these structures here, which I'm uh, circling my cursor over, okay? Th those structures there and these structures over here. This structure is later out here, okay? So these structures right here. And what you see in here is some kind of a structure in here. Uh, where'd my cursor go? Yeah, some kind of a structure in here. You can see the remains of the walls uh, and it's subdivided into smaller sections by a series of thin walls. And then, um, uh, and it was built on bedrock, okay? And in the very center of the remains of this structure, you can see a, uh, let me get my cursor uh, moving here. Can you see there's a circular structure in the heart of that? Here's the circular structure, okay? There's a circle of stones in the center. Uh, there was a depression in the floor there with a six foot wide circular depression. Okay, so a ring of stones with a depression inside it, and it contained a layer of ash and charred animal bones. Okay, and a chalice was discovered nearby. You see the photo of the chalice there. Uh, a chalice is a uh, type of a vessel used for cultic purposes. So the discovery of a chalice nearby, along with scattered hearths or fireplaces, suggested that this stratum two structure was a small cultic site where offerings were made. Uh, down here to the uh, west of that structure, you can see over here the remains of a building. This, uh, these structures here are the remains of what are called a four room house. Uh, this was a uh, type of a house that was distinctive to the uh, Israelites that was in use from even before 1250 BC, but all the way down to the destruction of Judah in 586. Um, but that four room house there at Mount Ebal may have been used by those who serviced the site, maybe uh, priests uh, live there and uh, carried out some kind of cultic activities at that circular enclosure. Okay. <clears throat> the site was significantly modified in stratum 1b. <clears throat> and that stratum dates to the end of the 13th or the beginning of the 12th century BC. Okay. And in that period, a monumental rectilinear structure was built above that earlier construction that I showed you. So right here, you can see the monumental rectilinear structure. And this is the structure everybody thinks of when they think of Mount Ebal. So this would be the altar. <clears throat> okay. So the monumental rectilinear structure was built out of unhewn stones, unworked stones. It was earlier stratum. Uh, the structure on Ebal that you see in the picture measures about 29 and a half, three feet. It's got no floor or entrance, and it seems to have been uh, deliberately filled with a 
multiple layers of bone, ash, and iron one pottery, including a whole collard rim jar. Okay, there was a small that uh, partially encircled the structure and uh, I'll show you better photos in just a minute, but the ledge goes up here. There's a ramp right there. The ledge runs parallel to it and it encircles the structure on three sides, okay? So uh, a frontal ramp and then a ledge on three sides. Uh, the ramp on the front is about five feet wide, okay? So this uh, so yeah, that ramp right there, it's about five feet wide. I'll show you a better picture in just a minute. Uh, but that ramp's located on the southeast side, and there are paved courtyards on either side ramp there and the other paved courtyard there. Both of those are paved, and each one of those includes numerous stone installations that were filled with ash jars, juglets, and another type of pottery called a pixides. Uh, the area of the four-room house is down here, but you can see during, where is my cursor? You can see during this period, the four-room house is gone. That's where it was. That area was um, uh, uh, paved over and uh, it, it was turned into a a gathering small uh, wall was built during this period to encircle the inside. So you can see this going around there. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's just another shot of the monumental structure of Stratum 1B. Uh, the Forum House was paved over. Yeah. In about 1140 BC, the site was um, ritually buried. And this is a fascinating stage. We actually have <coughs> uh, several examples <coughs> of ritual burial in antiquity where uh, cultic sites would be uh, buried so that later uh, generations wouldn't tamper them or uh, bring impurity in them once they had gone out of use. <coughs> but at Mount Ebal, the site appears to have been deliberately covered over with stones. <clears throat> sometime around 1140 BC in order to protect it. All right, uh, here is a shot of the site today and you can see um, Adam <clears throat> standing. Uh, that's me on the side, there's Adam. Uh, so it gives you some kind of a size comparison. If you've not been to the site, you can see how massive uh, it was. Uh, there we are standing in front of it. <clears throat> um, but in 1985, he suggested that the main structure of Stratum 1B may have been associated with Joshua 8, 30 through 35, and that it may have served as a central sanctuary among the early Israelites. There were critics, uh, some of these critics um, uh, made arguments that the site had uh, actually been a watchtower. One of the famous uh, critics was Aharon Kempinski. He said that it was a uh, watchtower that had evolved from a house. Uh, so the, the earliest level was a house and it was later remodeled into a watchtower. Um, <laughs> another archaeologist named William G. Deaver, <clears throat> um, very famous American archaeologist, he gave a lecture at the Smithsonian in 1992 and he jokingly dismissed the site as either, uh, uh, actually as a barbecue site. But uh, I dealt with um, uh, studying all of these potential options and the interpretation of the site in, in the two books uh, Aaron mentioned, that Iron Age One Structure on Mount Ebal and uh, a book I published in 2013 called How Israel Became a People. Um, so I'm not going to go back and uh, uh, look at detail, in detail at those archaeological arguments. We're just going to work on the assumption that this was a cultic site. And uh, I argue in both of those books that this was the site that uh, lay behind the account in Joshua 8, 30 through 35. So um, you can take a look at those books if you'd like to see more about the archeological data. Uh, what I wanna do is focus in on the biblical description of the altar on Mount Ebal and look at some of the particulars uh, that we have in the biblical text about 
uh, the structure, which um, is quite fascinating. So if you have your Bible open and you'd like to follow along, <clears throat> we'll be in Joshua 8, 30 through 35. And um, what we're told in verse 31 is that what was built on Mount Ebal was an altar of whole stones upon which uh, they'd been shaped using, um, uh, they had not been shaped uh, with uh, any iron tool. So they're whole stones. Um, some translations might render that unworked stones. Okay, So no iron tool has been used uh, to shape them. Uh, that's a real interesting um, part of the instructions for making the site that they be whole or uncut stones. And it's not clear why the stones should be unworked, <clears throat> um, but it could be that the condition of the stones mirrors the condition of animals that could be appropriately used for sacrifice. If you think back to the instruction when uh, uh, instructions are given in the book of Leviticus for the kinds of animals that could be used in sacrifice, what kinds of animals were they? You remember Leviticus 1.3 says, any animal used in sacrifice has to be without blemish, right? Animals had to be um, without blemish. So it may be that the stones used in the altar for sacrifices were also supposed to be whole. Uh, only whole animals uh, could be offered. Only whole stones could be used. Um, that's a little bit of a speculation, but it, it does um, resonate with the idea that religious behavior tends to be conservative, all right? Uh, you understand what I mean by that? Religious behavior tends to preserve time-honored rituals. Uh, religious uh, behaviors tend to use old-fashioned materials, okay? That just tends to be a phenomena of, uh, of religion in general. Rel religious behaviors tend to use time-honored rituals and old-fashioned materials, even when modern methods and modern materials are available. Rituals tend to use old, old rituals and old materials. Uh, you can see in the photos there, by the way, that's a close-up of the side of the altar, and you can see that the stones are whole stones. They're, they're not shaped or worked. They're just the stones as they were found on the ground or as they were excavated out of the ground and they were assembled and fitted together uh, in the shape of the altar. Um, all right, uh, even so, so religious behavior tends to be conservative. Old rituals tend to be used, old materials tend to be used. Even the pro, pro um, um, all right, rituals tend to be carried out with more primitive materials than what is available in current technology, all right? Um, so once the Israelites had built the altar of unhewn stones, they offered two kinds of offerings on it. They offered um, the, an offering that's called the Olot, the whole burnt offering, and the shlemim, or the uh, peace offering, the well-being offering. And I just want to say a few words about each of these types of offerings here. Uh, the um, olah, the burnt offering, that, that's described in Leviticus chapter 1. And that was the type of offering where the animal was killed and put on the altar, or it was dismembered and put on the altar. And the animal put on the altar was entirely consumed by fire. All right, there were no edible parts remaining after the Ola. Okay, so the idea in Leviticus is that by substituting the life of an animal for the, for the sinner, for the penitent uh, offerer, the burnt offering would render atonement. That's a fancy word if you break it down uh, at one minute. Uh, the idea of atonement is that it makes you at one with the God. Okay, so by substituting the life of an animal for the center, the burnt offering renders uh, atonement. The Ola, the burnt offering, also appears to have represented a gift to the Lord. Okay, so that's the first type of offering that was made at Mount Ebal was the Ola. 
The second type of offering was the shlemim. Uh, you can hear the word shalom in there, peace. So the shlemim was the peace offering. Uh, it's also sometimes been translated as the well-being offering. Uh, this offering was regulated by a different set of ritual requirements. Um, and the nature of this offering has been a little bit unclear. It's a, a lot of commentary written about this offering. Um, it was cooked on the altar, that's clear, but um, parts of the meat were then held back and eaten by those in attendance at the Shlemim. So parts would be given to the priests for them to eat, and parts would be eaten by uh, the participants, the families involved. Uh, if you look at Deuteronomy 27.7, it seems that the primary feature of the shlemim, the, the peace offering, is that it was offered and eaten with rejoicing. So the shlemim was a big, uh, like a big outdoor barbecue. <laughs> they would roast the meat on the altar, and then they'd take much of it back, and the priests would be fed, and then the family would sit around at picnic tables around the altar, and have uh, a big cookout. Now, the name of the offering and how it's translated um, uh, is very interesting. Uh, it's been, the Shlemim has been translated as peace offering. It's been translated as a communion offering, a recompense offering, and also as a gift offering. The guy you see in the picture down there is a very famous um, uh, Hebrew Bible scholar named Jacob Milgram, who uh, sadly uh, died a few years ago, but he translated the Shlemim as the well-being offering, okay? And he wrote one of the, probably the biggest commentary on Leviticus that's ever been written. Uh, you can see the cover of one of the volumes there. It's actually a three volume commentary and each volume is about a thousand pages long. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, he translated the Shlemim as well-being offering. And um, the reason he did that, <clears throat> he was basing his translation on the idea that the offering, the Shlemim celebrates the successful conclusion of the covenant, okay? So the fact that the well-being offering provides meat uh, reinforces its celebratory nature. Okay, in the ancient world, common people typically could not afford the depletion of their flocks, so they didn't eat meat uh, real often. And Milgram explains that for the commoner, uh, the occasion had to be a celebration. And because the meat was probably too much for just a nuclear family, you know, mom and dad and two kids, uh, it was probably a household or clan celebration. Uh, so it was a very joyous occasion. It was an outdoor barbecue, but the Shlemim was uh, not only an outdoor barbecue, but it was also like a family reunion. The family would come together and celebrate the, celebrate the well-being they had with the Lord as a result of the covenant. All right. In the case of the Ebal offering, the instructions for the well-being offering specified that it was to be eaten with rejoicing before the Lord. Uh, it specifically says that in Deuteronomy 27, uh, verse 7, where the instructions about the altar at Ebal are repeated. Okay. So presumably the feast would be eaten in the vicinity of the altar. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to move along quickly because of the time. Now, uh, oh, let me just show you this, a detail about the physical structure. <clears throat> uh, it is interesting. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a photograph uh, of the interior of the structure. So these are the inner walls of the structure. The interior was actually hollow. You can see another photo here. Uh, and it's very interesting because within that hollowed out area of the structure <clears throat> were four layers of ash. And when the ash was studied, it was determined that those layers of ash included burned bone remains. Here you can see a 
schematic drawing, an archeological drawing of the layers. And you can see uh, there's a layer of stone at the top to seal these layers. And then there are uh, these layers of ashy uh, soil remains with uh, bone fragments and uh, so on inside them, okay? Uh, so very interesting. The interior of the structure was full of these remains. Um, and then also around the structure were more than 50 small installations that you can see here in this drawing. And these small installations, what they would do is they would make a ring of stones and they would dig a little pit inside. And uh, once they had uh, made their offerings and eaten parts, they would put uh, uh, the ashy remains with bone fragments and so on in these little pottery vessels and put them in these installations. And these were, are uh, kind of like offerings that people would leave behind after uh, they had worshiped at Mount Ebal. Okay, uh, the remains that were inside the uh, installations, okay, they, uh, uh, they did not consist of donkeys, horses, pigs, carnivores, and gazelles. All of those things are absent from Ebal. Uh, pig is absent. That's very interesting because there are a lot of pigs in the region. But what was in these installations are pro proportions of... Um, uh, high proportions of the remains from four parts of animals. And uh, this is probably associated with Exodus 29 and Leviticus 7, where it says that the Israelites were to offer the right foreleg of the animal and to give the right hind leg to the priests. So the rem animal remains found in the fill and in the, the installations around the central structure at Ebal match the uh, uh, requirements for sacrifice in Exodus 29 and Leviticus 7, if that makes sense. Okay, so very, very interesting. Uh, there's a map, uh, a, a, an artistic rendering showing you the uh, pieces that could be offered. All right, now let's go on uh, quickly. Uh, we're also told that um, in the vicinity of the altar, Joshua wrote onto the stones a copy of the teaching of Moses. Now, that's what it says in verse 32. <clears throat> this is a really interesting um, thing. Verse 32 seems to have specific stones in mind, but um, uh, Joshua wrote a copy of the teaching on Moses on these stones. But the text of Joshua does not say which stones these were. Okay, it never says which stones these were. Now, the only stones mentioned so far in Joshua 8 are the stones of the altar. And so one might presume that the teaching of Moses was written upon the stones of the altar themselves. But... Um, the text doesn't actually say that. If we went back to Deuteronomy 27, which is the other uh, instruction about the Ebal altar, Deuteronomy 27, verse 2 and 4 specify that large stones were to be set up in conjunction with the construction of the altar. Okay. It says these st stones were to be covered with plaster. And it says that on those stones were to be written a copy of the law. Okay, uh, verse 8 says that. <clears throat> now, there was a scholar named Andrew Hill. He died several years ago. He proposed that Deuteronomy 27 was modeled on royal land grant ceremonies and um, that the uh, text that is being described would have been in, in, uh, inscribed on stones uh, that, that were uh, installed in the land grant ceremonies, okay? Uh, and what would happen in these land grant ceremonies is that uh, land would be granted to a king and uh, the uh, boundaries of the land would be specified on a type of a stone called a kuduru stone. These were Babylonian boundary stones. Okay, and you can see an example of one of these from the 12th century 
uh, in the picture there. So what Hill was suggesting was that the Israelites uh, went up to Ebal. God granted them the land, which he had already done that uh, in the Abrahamic covenant. You know, he'd specified the land in Genesis 15. Uh, in Numbers, the land was specified as well. And so it was recorded on this. Kuduru. So he's suggesting the stones at Ebal were not the stones of the altar, but that they were like these Kuduru stones. They were set up nearby, and uh, whatever was written on them um, uh, was, was written there. Maybe copies of the Torah, maybe a description of the land uh, that was be, being given. All right. Uh, there's another scholar named uh, Daniel Block, and you can see his photo there. Um, he argues that the chapter more closely resembles Babylonian entitlement inscription. Uh, An entitlement um, stones are called Naru in Babylonian. And what happens with these Naru stones is they memorialize the receipt of an entitlement within a feudal system. So a king gives a lord land and uh, the king would set up, or, or the Lord would then set up Naru stones at various points in the land to memorialize the fact that he had received this land. Okay, does that make sense? So what Daniel Block was suggesting was very similar to what Andrew Hill was suggesting. The Israelites went to Mount Ebal, and they set up Naru inscriptions, which uh, recorded the gift of the land in the Torah, and maybe described uh, the boundaries of the land or something like that as well. <clears throat> All right. In either case, whether the stones were like uh, the Babylonian boundary stones or like the uh, Naru inscriptions, uh, in either case, <clears throat> the practice of setting up an inscribed stone as a claim of ownership in connection with a military campaign that finds parallels all over the ancient Near East. It finds parallels in ancient Egypt. Um, and the book of Joshua is actually very similar to those accounts. Joshua led the Israelites on a campaign into the land of Canaan. He carried out a military conquest, and then he set up inscribed stones as a claim of ownership. Just like the Kuduru inscriptions of a land grant or the Naru inscriptions of a Babylonian entitlement inscription, these stones at Ebal may have contained a description of the land that the Lord had given to Israel. So they set up the monument, the altar, and then set up the stones around them. All right. Uh, another little detail from Deuteronomy 27, Deuteronomy 27 verse 4 specifies that the stones, wherever they were, or whether they were the stones of the altar or whether they were stones around the altar, Deuteronomy 27, 4 says those stones were to be covered with plaster. All right. Uh, preparing rough stones for artistic or literary purposes, that uh, is something we know about that goes all the way back to the Calcolithic period. We have examples of covering stones with plaster so that you could write on them. Um, Deuteronomy 27 does not say how the text would be prepared for writing. Um, it's, you know, one possibility would that would be that the Israelites, maybe they took chisels and etched the words onto the stones. But it seems more likely that the inscription was probably written with ink. All right. We have examples of this from antiquity. This uh, photo you see here is from the um, Jordan National Museum in Amman, and it's a photograph of uh, the Balaam texts from uh, a site called Deir Allah. It, you might remember in the book of Numbers, the prophet Balaam was summoned by uh, King Balak to curse the Israelites. You remember he went in front of the Israelites three times, and every time he would try to curse them, he'd open his mouth but he would simply reaffirm the promises of God to the Israelites anytime he opened his mouth. <clears throat> well, at a, an archaeological site in Jordan called Deir Allah, <clears throat> uh, an inscription was found uh, recording prophecies of Balaam 
and this is a, a photograph of um, the Bedlam inscription. So you can see they're written on plaster. So um, the people at Deir Allah, they shellacked the surface with plaster and then they wrote on the plaster with ink. Okay, that's probably how <laughs> the uh, stones at Ebal were prepared. They were shellacked with plaster and then uh, they used ink to write on the plaster. <clears throat> there have been remains of plaster found at Ebal. This is a photograph I took in the Zenman laboratory uh, back in 2007. And I'm, I'm looking at uh, boxes with the plaster remains from Mount Ebal. That's, I'm holding one of the pieces there. And he's not in this photograph, but Shai Bar is standing right over there <laughs> in that photograph. Um, but so that's, uh, you know, there was probably more plaster at Ebal, um, uh, but it has not yet been discovered. And uh, no ink remains, as far as I'm aware, have been discovered on these plaster remains. But in any case, um, <clears throat> okay. Well, in verses 33 through 35, <clears throat> the text specifies that all Israel, uh, participated in the ceremonies at Mount Ebal. <clears throat> um, in addition to the elders, the officers, and judges of the people, the ceremonies included aliens and citizens. Okay, very, very significant. It's very significant that all social categories were represented, including women, children, and aliens. All right, very interesting. Uh, when God made the promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, he said he was going to, to uh, build a nation through Abraham and that through that in that nation, he would uh, ultimately reveal a religion. And through that religion, all humankind could be blessed. All right. Um, in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, the, their laws were for the privilege privileged classes. Their religion gave special treatment to the upper classes, to royalty, and so on. In Israel, though, the whole purpose of the religion was to introduce God to all humankind, that all, every family on earth could be blessed. And that's what is um, happening here. Every strata of society was being invited to participate, even aliens or non-blood relatives, okay? All right. Uh, aliens are actually mentioned twice in verses 33, uh, 30 through 35. They participated in the ceremonies at Ebal. Um, the mention of aliens probably refers to those who, by faith in the Lord, had been grafted into the community of Israel. Uh, we have examples of people like this. Uh, one of them is the famous Rahab, the prostitute, who uh, first comes on the scene in Joshua chapter 2. Uh, she hid the spies, you know, as they went to do a reconnaissance mission in Israel. And uh, uh, then she helped them escape from the Canaanite king when he uh, sought them out. And then in Joshua 6, we're told the Israelites spared Rahab and her family and Jewish tradition um, <clears throat> claims that um, she uh, eventually married Joshua, and uh, uh, she features in the genealogy of Jesus in, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. Uh, so she was grafted into Israel by faith, okay? Uh, so people like uh, uh, Rahab. Other peoples uh, were grafted into the ancient uh, Israelite nation as well. For example, the uh, um, in Joshua 7, the uh, Gibeonites uh, made a covenant with the Israelites and were grafted in. Um, <clears throat> lots of other examples later in the text. <clears throat> uh, it's interesting if you go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy provides very liberally for non Israelites who lived among the Israelites. And you can see some of the laws that govern the treatment of. Um, aliens in Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29. <clears throat> um, uh, in principle, the religious community of ancient Israel was very open to uh, aliens. You can see some additional instruction in Deuteronomy 23, 7 and 8. All right. So the inclusion of aliens in the ceremonies at Mount Ebal is very consistent uh, with 
uh, with that. All right. Uh, Joshua read out to the people all the stipulations of the law. Verse 34 says, Joshua 8, 34, including the blessings and the curses, according to all that was written in the book of the teaching. Okay. The recitation of the blessings and curses uh, in Joshua 8, they make it clear that those in assembly at Mount Ebal were being called upon to participate in a covenant renewal service. They were uh, renewing the covenant from Sinai, and they were accepting the terms of the covenant. Okay, The reciting of the blessings and curses uh, makes that clear. Uh, so these verses in uh, uh, Joshua 8, they make it very clear that what we have here in Joshua 8, 30 through 35 is a fulfillment of Deuteronomy 27, verses 4 through 8, where Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formally commanded the Israelites to do this. All right. Um, the last verse, verse 35 concludes by noting that Joshua read these words before all Israel, okay, the entire nation, including the women, the little ones, and the aliens who lived among them, all right? Uh, what we have in Joshua 1 through 8, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through Joshua 8, verse 35, we have a trajectory that heads toward the Ebal ceremony. And in Joshua 8, it concludes with the, with, with the uh, uh, renewal of the Sinai Covenant on Mount Ebal. Um, very, very significant. And Joshua 8 is the crescendo of uh, the early Israelite settlement in the land of Canaan. All right. So what I have told you as we conclude, Joshua 8, 30 through 35 serves as the culmination of the story of Israel's entrance in the land of Canaan. After crossing the Jordan and conquering Jericho and Ai, the Israelites proceeded to Mount Ebal, where they established a cultic center. The site featured an altar, along with standing stones that bore the words of the covenant, and maybe had a description of the land that God had given Israel. Okay? Uh, those stones may be connected with Israel's military campaigns. They may symbolize Israel's ownership of the land of Canaan. And this is a concept that finds many parallels in the Middle uh, and New Kingdom of Egypt, as well as the wider ancient Near East. So these chapters of Joshua 8 through 30 through 35, they serve to confirm the Lord's faithfulness to the Abrahamic promises uh, they reaffirm the idea that God brought Abraham's descendants into a good land, which he gave into their hand, as he had promised Abraham that he would. Thank you so much for your uh, attention. That's Adam. Uh, back in 2007, uh, explaining all these details to me. <laughs> So thank much. you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen, we're going to move to the questions and answers uh, section. Uh, and I, I would like to start off by asking you a question. If um, Mount Ibal was right now open for archaeological excavations um, and you were assigned to, to excavate there, what would you do? What would I do? I would try to assemble a team <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and go there. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would uh, try to. I would be raising money and trying to. Uh, is there is there is there is there anything else to research after Adam Zertel's work? Oh, I don't know. I mean, of, of course the. <clears throat> I mean, it's a great question. I. Um, I mean, you know, archaeologically, when um, someone excavates a site, um, you know, the the the, um, the end of the excavation would come either when you reached floor levels or when you hit bedrock, <clears throat> and 
in the excavation at Mount Ebal, they excavated down to bedrock. Uh, the stratum two, <coughs> the stratum two remains. <coughs> <they're, coughs> excuse me. The stratum two remains were built on bedrock. So, um, <coughs> as far as going down deeper, you know, that's not an issue there. Um, uh, there may be uh, on Adam's site plan. If you look at the site plan where it shows the entire site, there are some areas that are labeled unexcavated. <clears throat> uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not a deep site. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, um, I think what he's excavated, you know, the, they, uh, they showed that the forum house was cleared to make a sort of a piazza where people could gather for ceremonies that would be conducted at Ebal. I don't think it's likely in those areas that, uh, that there would be other remains to be discovered. Um, I, I think the, the excavation was pretty comprehensive. Um, you know, the one thing lacking was um, organic material <clears throat> that could be used for carbon-14 dating. But that's a problem at this site, which, you, as you are aware, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it was comprehensively excavated. The nature of the climate and the nature of the site itself uh, r really kind of preclude the discovery of uh, of many organic remains. But you know, it's it's possible that further excavation ex excavation could reveal something. Um, the sifting project, of course, that was recently conducted by Stripling, <clears throat> which uh, unfortunately I was not able to participate in because it was right in the middle of my semester. Um, but, you know, that that was a very exciting project, which yielded this new um, uh, very small inscription, <clears throat> which, uh, you know, al although it wasn't a whole lot, I mean, it reinforces the idea that this was a, um, <clears throat> a significant site within the ancient Israelite imagination and that it continued to have significance uh, in later periods. So, uh, so that was a very significant discovery. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I don't know um, that there's a lot of need for further excavation. Maybe... Um, you know, when Shai publishes the uh, <clears throat> final report, I, I don't think any decision needs to be made about further excavation until we see the final report. That That's going to be a treasure trove of uh, information. Um, I have read um, the Pottery Report because um, the guy who put that together, I, I won't mention his name, but uh, the guy who put that together for the report, he actually sent it to me and uh, asked uh, me to publish it in the Zertal Memorial. And I said, no way, we can't publish that. That needs to go in the report. <clears throat> but it's 100 pages long, <clears throat> and it definitively shows uh, Adam's dating, you know, it definitively establishes the cultic nature of the site. So the, so the final report is going to be a treasure trove of uh, information. And, uh, and I think it will, my, my own view is that it's going to definitively establish the, uh, the, the cultic nature of the site, the Israelite ethnicity of the site, and, um, you know, so, so yeah, kind of a long answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're opening uh, this to uh, Q&A. So if anybody wants to ask uh, Dr. Ralph a question, please feel free to do so. I would like to ask, uh, Rick Mo. Uh, I would like to ask the uh, writing of the law on the stones with the plaster, the law would have been uh, huge. So did they just write a portion on the plaster? And if so, what portion do you think would have been written? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's such a good question. Um, and in, in my forthcoming commentary on Joshua, I discussed that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it, it's a little tricky. 
because um, in the Hebrew, uh, in verse 32, I'm just looking at the New Revised Standard Version here. It says, in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses. So in the Hebrew, it, it just says he wrote on the stones a copy of the Torah of Moses. So Torah, it can, of course, be translated law, but, um, but it comes from a verb that means to show the way. And it, it could also be translated teaching, instruction, guidance. Um, we've kind of you know, we've been conditioned when we see that word Torah to think law as in legislative material, but uh, it doesn't always um, mean that, you know, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy is t Torah, but um, it's certainly not all legislative material, right? <clears throat> you know, the stories of Abraham are Torah, you know, uh, but what do they teach us? They, they teach us about what real faith is. You know, when, in the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul wanted to teach um, in the book of Romans, when he wanted to teach the congregation what real faith was, he said, OK, let's look back to the Torah. And he spends, you know, a lot of time drawing out the stories of Abraham's call and migration and, uh, you know, but that's not legislative material, but it is Torah. It has a lot to teach. You know, Genesis 1 and 2 are not legislative material, but they are Torah. You know, they teach us about, you know, who, who is the God of the universe? Is it Marduk? Is it uh, Baal? Is it Dagon of the Philistines? No, it's Elohim, you know, the God of the universe. Um, and, uh, and here's how that God undertook creation, you know. Um, so all, all through Genesis through Deuteronomy, we have Torah, uh, and it's not all legislative. Uh, anyway, I say all that just to say, um, you know, what, what did they put on the um, stones at Ebal? Well, they put the, the uh, Torah of Moses, but... You know, it, it could have been, um, you know, the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy 27. You know, uh, it, it, um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, uh, it, it could be that, uh, you know, maybe one stone had the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy 27. Maybe another stone had the uh, land allotments of Joshua 13 through 21, uh, but, you know, those allotments had also been outlined in the book of Numbers, but um, uh, certainly it was not, you know, the full contents of Genesis through Deuteronomy, and, and I don't think the text calls for that. Um, uh, you know, again, we hear the book of the law of Moses, and we think the book, we think an entire book, but in Hebrew, the word for book is sefer, and um, uh, when they say uh, it was written down in a sefer, that could re refer to a small inscription, you know, containing a single verse, that would be a, se a sefer, you know, so not necessarily a book as we think of a book, so um, I, I think Torah is kind of the same way. It, it could refer to, you know, some, um, you know, sig significant piece of the Torah that was pertinent to the establishment of the structure at Ebal. Aaron? Any, any more questions? Yes, I'm, I'm curious, um, maybe you can comment on the logistics of the site and when uh, Joshua is reading to all of Israel, right? It's such a huge number comes to my mind. Of how is this possible? And is the terrain suitable that you can imagine, you know, large groups of people gathering there to hear the reading of the law? I'm very curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, and um, it, it is it is a good question. And the, the answer is a little bit complicated because it gets into the location of Mount Gerizim in relation to Mount Ebal. 
And uh, if you go to the side of Ibal and you look down, look over to the traditional location of Mount Gerizim, there's, um, uh, you know, the city of Shechem lies between the two, the modern um, city of Nablus. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, a long way off <laughs> to Mount Gerizim. Uh, um, <clears throat> Zertal argued, and the his argument is uh, it, it's not complicated, but it's a little. I don't, I don't want to get in the details of it, but he argued for various reasons that Gerizim was not correct that the uh, the traditional location of Mount Gerizim was not correct, um, and he, sometimes we see in antiquity that names uh, will migrate. Uh, that sounds so strange to us, but Sometimes you see that happen. And the, the idea that uh, the traditional location of Mount Gerizim is, is incorrect actually goes back into remote antiquity, not remote antiquity, but it goes back into antiquity. Um, I explore this a little bit in my book, both of my books. Um, Josephus mentions it. Others mention that the name had shifted. And Zertal um, made an argument that the correct location of Mount Gerizim was a place called Mount Kabir. And that's actually uh, Mount Ebal, the structure on Ebal is on the second slope from the summit of Mount Ebal on the northern side. So obviously if, if the traditional Gerizim was correct, that would be, you know, there'd be no way <laughs> for, for the blessings and curses to have happened as the text describes. But Jebel Kabir is right across from uh, the Ebal structure, if that's the correct location. Um, so, you know, um, did the entire nation participate in the recitation? Uh, I'm not sure about that. It could, you know, it could have been representatives of the elders, you know, representatives of each tribe, along with some elders, you know, maybe participated. But um, I don't know that that's uh, neither here nor there. Um, but the, if the Ebal side is correct and the Jebel Kabir side is correct, uh, then I'd say it's quite, quite feasible. I don't know that each side necessarily had to audibly hear everything, though. You know, it's a symbolic uh, action as well. So, you know, I, I don't know if that helps. You can get, by the way, Zertal made these arguments in um, a book that he published in Hebrew called Amnolad, which means birth of a nation. And uh, that volume was uh, translated into English and uh, has recently been republished by uh, Aaron Lipkin by his company. So you can get that uh, in English. It's called The Birth of a Nation and Aaron can tell you how to get it. But in that book, Adam spells out his theory, that whole theory in great detail. So it's a great, great book. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Ralph, I just want to add that I have my own theory and it actually connects to uh, theories that uh, other Bible scholars in Israel also have, and that is that the ceremony described in Joshua didn't take place in one place. It took it took place actually in two places. One in the amphitheater between the Samaritan Gerizim and Mount Ibal, um, which actually makes Shechem or the Temple of Shechem the center of the ceremony, um, and also where the altar is on the eastern slopes. Uh, overlooking uh, eastward towards uh, the Jordanian, the, the Gilead Mountains. Now, you know, when as, as we just we just finished the session about the Gilgals, the the oval shaped structures, and Zertal writes in his book that what makes him uh, astonished is that at most of the footprint structures, the amphitheaters are also all the time looking eastward towards Gilead, towards the Jabok Pass. Uh, probably commemorating Jacob or what happened there. And so what we have here is Joshua's altar on the slopes of Mount Ibal with an amphitheater looking eastward towards the Gilead, to, just like the other Gilgars, like the other footprint structures. 
and also a ceremony commemorating the holy site of Shechem and and the you know the stories around that site, the Ark of the Covenant there, and you know the, the, I think I believe that there is a temple of Adonai that is also at a certain point mentioned in Shechem. So you know these these two sites uh, actually correspond with each other. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, the the uh, the the piazza at Ibal, the gathering area. Yeah, faces east. That's very interesting. So, next question. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you all. I just want to give you all uh, three updates about uh, Joshua Zolter. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, because of uh, extreme uh, destruction to uh, many archaeological sites in Judea and Samaria, uh, through robbery and vandalism, the Israeli parliament has convened and uh, made decisions to, um, uh, 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 first of all, have more uh, manpower to, to guard and to uh, overlook those sites. And there was a, a, a big, uh, a big uh, call to ask the uh, Israeli Archaeological Authority to also apply its uh, um, uh, responsibility and uh, and and um, um, uh, power over the sites in Judea and Samaria, which are currently under the Israeli army, uh, Israeli army control. So uh, that's ongoing, and we hope to have uh, good uh, good news. Soon, uh, President, uh, the President of Israel, uh, uh, Herzog, just announced that all the sites in Judea and Samaria, the archaeological sites, have to be guarded and preserved. Um, the second uh, good news is that uh, the lead tablet that was found by Scott Stripling uh, is, uh, is being analyzed and the results are fascinating. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I cannot um, uh, tell you everything, but I can tell you that uh, Hebrew uh, letters were identified inside the lead tablet, and uh, there's actually even a word that was identified, and I cannot tell you what that word is. I promise, Scott, I won't say. But uh, when you when you know when you'll know, you'll be amazed uh, because it it really connects to uh, the ceremony. So uh, that's the uh, second piece of information. The third and last piece of information is that uh, um, because there wasn't a final report uh, that was published about Joshua's altar and the discovery, the academic world did not regard it, uh, did not uh, uh, talk about it or uh, convene or every academic uh, discovery like that has to have a final report for uh, professors to discuss it and, and give their interpretations. And so because um, there was a lack of uh, funding for the final report, it didn't come out. And we're talking about something, a, a, a discovery that was made in the 1980s, guys. This is 2022, such an important discovery, no final report. So uh, I just got word that uh, uh, the Menasseh Hill Country Survey team has received funding for the final report and uh, that the final report will be uh, finalized in the next two years and hopefully in two years we're going to have a big event uh, that will celebrate the final report and this will become a fact in the archaeological world the academic world and uh, this is very very exciting uh, so with all these three amazing uh, pieces of news, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ralph Hawkins for a very interesting uh, session about Joshua Zolter. And uh, looking forward to seeing all of you in the next session about Shiloh with Dr. Scott Stripling. And if you convince Scott, maybe he will be willing to share uh, some of the news about the lead tablet. So uh, with all of that, thank you so much. Shalom and blessings from Israel. And uh, thank you, Dr. Alf. And we are all waiting here for in Israel for you uh, to come and visit the Gilgals and Joshua's altar and all the other sites that we're going to talk about. So Shalom from Samaria. <laughs>